Well, good morning again, neighbor. Glad that you are here in my neighborhood. During this series, we have been exploring what it means to be a neighbor. And I know that most of us, everything we learned about being a neighbor, we learned from Mr. Rogers. But everything Mr. Rogers knew about being a neighbor, he learned from Jesus. So in this series, we're going back to the source. And we're asking, what does it mean when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself? And we've come to the conclusion that the most loving thing that we can do is to invite our neighbors into a life-transforming relationship with Jesus. It is the most neighborly thing we can do. It is better than weeding your gardens, keeping your lawns mowed on time. It's better than lending a cup of sugar. The single most loving thing you can do as a neighbor is to invite your neighbor into a life-transforming relationship with Jesus. Now, yesterday I was at Kroger, and I was wearing my Won't You Be My Neighbor t-shirt. I was on my way to the block party, which, by the way, if you missed the block party out at Fort Liberty Playland on Saturday, no worries. There's another one this Saturday, Beckett Park West. Make sure you're there. Check the website for more details. You'll, you'll love it. But I'm wearing my neighborhood t-shirt, and the guy who's checking me out, he goes, ah, Mr. Rogers, I get it. I see what you're doing there. And I said, oh, you're a smart one. And uh, all <laughs> snarky like that. And, uh, um, and he goes, well, you know what made Mr. Rogers' neighborhood so great, don't you? And I said, no, tell me. And he said, no people. And I, I, and I go, wait, what are you talking about? And he goes, no, 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 think about it. There, think about the promo video. They had the camera flying over the neighborhood. You see the houses, the cars, the every, but no people. He goes, that's why Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was so great. And so I had that in my head. I'm leaving Kroger's, and then I head over to the block party. And I got to hang out with some of the most amazing neighbors I know, some people who I just have really grown to love and respect. And, and we just spent time eating together and sharing life together and sharing stories together. And we had this amazing time together. And you know, when I left the block party, you know what I realized? My friend at Kroger's was wrong. It's the people that make the neighborhood. It's the people that make the neighborhood what it is. And we are those people. We are those Neighbors. So today I want to tell you a story from the Bible about neighboring and about some people who made the neighborhood what it was. So I want to invite you, if you brought a Bible today, go with me to Mark chapter 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Mark chapter 2. And this is a story that Mark tells. This is not a parable. This is not a story that Jesus made up. This is a story that Jesus actually lived. And so I want to invite you to think about this story from the perspective of being a good neighbor. Mark 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered there that it, though there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them and healed them. Some men came bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus after digging through it. They lowered the mat of the paralyzed man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like this? Why does this fellow talk like that? He is blaspheming. For who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and go home. But so that you would know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. The man got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of all of them. And this amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, We've never seen anything like this. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
You know, there's so much going on in this story. I could preach about it for months. I mean, there are, there's so much to preach on. I mean, I could preach on Jesus' ability just to show up and fill a room, right? Jesus just shows up and people just flock. To Jesus, And I could preach about the, the need for us to be sharing Jesus' stories and lifting up Jesus in the church because there are some empty seats next to you. And those seats need to be filled by the people you know who need Jesus. I could preach a, a whole series on Jesus' ability to heal people's infirmities, people, His ability to help people in their time of need. I could preach a sermon on Jesus' ability to forgive sins, right? This whole concept of, of sin forgiveness. But today I want to do something just a little out of the ordinary. Today I want to preach not so much on Jesus and not even really on the paralyzed man, but I want to preach on His four friends. You know, the four folks who was carrying him in, one on each corner of the mat, carrying him to Jesus. Because the Bible tells us that when they lowered this man down through the roof, Jesus saw their faith. The four friends. He saw their faith, and because of their faith, he healed this man. And I want to ask the question, what is it about these four friends that is so dynamic that they're willing to do anything it takes to bring their friend to Jesus? Including digging a hole through the roof of this house. Now, I want you to picture that for just a second. All right? I want you to think about you've invited Jesus to your house. You know, some of the neighbors have come over. You know, the people have heard about what's going on. It's kind of a big deal. And so people are parking on your lawn, and that's a little annoying. And people are walking through the flower gardens in order to get in. And people haven't wiped their shoes. And so you're a little annoyed because the carpets are dirty. And, and this is just a bigger deal than you thought it was going to be. But you finally got Jesus in the house, and Jesus is teaching and healing, and everything is going well. And all of a sudden, one of your neighbors starts digging through your roof. Somebody in here is going to go, wait a minute, you've gone too far. That's just too much. But these four friends, they, they knew what it meant to answer the question, who are you bringing to Jesus? You know, we've been asking you that question every week during this series. Who, which of your neighbors are you bringing to Jesus through Cornerstone? through an event, through a mission opportunity, through a, 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 a Bible study. Who are you bringing to Jesus? And these four friends knew how to do that. They knew the definition of neighborhood was to invite our neighbors into a life-transforming relationship with Jesus. They got it. And so I've come to believe that these four friends are four friends that all of us need in our lives. And I've kind of assigned them some personality characteristics. So go with me here. On, and I, So I want you to dream with me here. You're the person on the mat. All right. You are the paralyzed person. And you got four friends carrying you. Who do you want these people to be? Strong enough not to drop you. I get that. That, that makes sense. But beyond that, what are the character qualities you want in these people who are carrying you to Jesus. Well, I'd like to suggest that one of the people you want carrying your mat, I call the chaplain. And the chaplain is on that right front corner of the mat, kind of leading the way. The chaplain is the person in your life who keeps your heart aligned with God's heart. The chaplain is that person in your life who reminds you to keep your eyes on Jesus. Your chaplain is your spiritual mentor. Do you have one of these in your life? Uh, a person who, who helps guide you towards God when you're starting to stray off the path. The book of Proverbs puts it this way. The righteous is a guide to his neighbors, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Do you have a guide, a God guide in your life that when you start getting off the path, guides you back? That's what a chaplain does. You know, another character quality of a chaplain is that a chaplain is somebody who is always faithful. And when I say faithful, I don't just mean they're on time. 
But I mean, a chaplain is full of faith, right? Think about that word and the way it was designed there. Full of faith. So when you're having trouble seeing God, when you're having trouble hearing God, your chaplain is the one who says, trust me, you're not alone. Your chaplain, when you're faithless, they are faithful. Are you following me? Who's your chaplain in life? Not only are they a spiritual mentor and are they faithful, but a chaplain is also that person who inspires you, right? The chaplain is a person you see their faith and you go, you know what, I want to be like that person. I want to know God like that person does. I want to be able to pray like that person does. I want to be able to, to live my life the way that person does. They inspire you to be a better version of you than you can be all by yourself. Proverbs 13 says this, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffer harm. I don't know about you, but I want to walk with a chaplain, so I become like a chaplain. See, here's how I know the chaplain was there that day carrying the mat of his paralyzed friend. I know that the chaplain was there because it was only the chaplain who was able to convince the other three that Jesus was the answer to this man's problem. The chaplain was the one who said, listen, his issues aren't just physical, they're spiritual. we got to get our friend to Jesus. The chaplain is the one who kept their eyes on God the whole time and said, we've got to get our friend in front of Jesus. So that day, one of the people carrying the mat was the chaplain. Here's my question, church. Who's your chaplain? Who's your spiritual mentor? Who's your faithful person? Who's that one who inspires you? Who's your chaplain? Another person that was carrying the mat that day, if the chaplain is on the front right, then on the back left is the cheerleader. You got a cheerleader in your life? Think about it, cheerleaders for a second. They're the people who are always in your corner. They're the people who are always rooting for you, who are always wanting the best for you. They're always encouraging, always supporting. A cheerleader will always be on your team. Do you have one of those in your life? A cheerleader is that person in your life who will be uncannily loyal to you. Proverbs puts it this way. A friend loves at all times, not just good times, not just easy times, not just convenient times, not just times when it's cheap or simple, but a friend loves at all times, will be loyal at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Do you have someone in your life who's loyal like that? Do you have a cheerleader who helps keep your eyes on the goal? who entertains you, who who keeps you connected, keeps your head in the game. Because if you think about sports cheerleaders, isn't that their job, right? The team starts to lose, they get down a couple of points, and, and the cheerleader's job is to help bring their heads back in the game to encourage and to inspire them to something bigger and better. A cheerleader will help you when the going gets tough. And so here's what I... Read in Proverbs, it says, A cheerful look brings joy to the heart, and good news makes for good health. You got somebody who, when they show up, it just brings joy to your heart. Right? The other really cool gift that a cheerleader brings is a smile to your face. A cheerleader will just simply make you smile. You have a friend in your life who just, just by sheer ability to walk in the room, you just go, <laughs> Right? That person who just, all they got to do is walk in the room and you just know it's going to be okay. There's a smile on your face. They lift your spirit. If you're a glass half full kind of person, they're the glass half full kind of person. If you're the glass half empty kind of person, they're the, yeah, you're right, Dave. Um, they're that kind of person. They make you smile. Proverbs describes them this way. A cheerful heart is good medicine, and a, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. You have the person who is good medicine for your life when you're struggling, when you're in need. Now, here's the way I know that there was a cheerleader carrying the mat that day. Because along with the chaplain up front, you need the 
the cheerleader, because the cheerleader is the one that when the group got to the house and they realized they couldn't get in the door, they couldn't squeeze by the crowd, they couldn't go in through the window, they couldn't get in anywhere else, the cheerleader said, come on guys, we can't quit. The cheerleader said, we can't just go home. We can't stop here. We have to get our friend in front of Jesus. I know there was a cheerleader there that day because they didn't quit when things got hard. Friends, do you have a cheerleader in your life? You need one. There was another person helping carry the mat that day on the back right next to the cheerleader was the challenger or the coach. And the coach is the one who's going to push you to do things you didn't think you could do. The coach is the one who's going to cause you to dig deeper than you thought you could do. dig, to, to think things you never thought you could think, to do things you never thought you could do all by yourself. And the coach or the challenger is going to challenge you to go to deeper levels because the coach, in essence, is a bit of an entrepreneur themselves. They, they think entrepreneurially. They're, they're the experts in their field. They know how this stuff works. They know there's a solution to the problem. Proverbs puts it this way. Do you see someone skilled in their work? They will serve before kings. They will not serve before officials of low rank. And so the challenger and the coach has kind of got this entrepreneurial thinking when it comes to problem solving. And not only are they entrepreneurial in that they know there is a problem that can be solved, but they're innovators. And they start thinking things that nobody else has ever thought of. They start problem solving in ways that nobody else has ever really considered. These challengers, these coaches, they are innovators in their thinking. And so they, they start thinking in these new and, and innovative kinds of ways. And so the the, the coach or the challenger is the one who said, you know, front door is not the only way to get in the house. The other thing I love about having a challenger or a coach in my life is that the coach or the challenger is the one who's going to say the hard thing. They're the brutally honest one in your life, right? They're the ones who are not going to just point at all the good things you're doing, but they're going to help challenge you even when those challenges feel painful. They're going to help say, yeah, yeah, that was a good play, but you have more to give. That was good work, but you could do it even better. They're going to help you dig deeper by saying the things that everybody else is afraid to say because they're the brutally honest one. Proverbs puts it this way. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. In other words, I'd rather have a friend tell me the truth even when it hurts than have a bunch of people who don't love me lie to me. Because I'm better. I need people in my life who love me enough to tell me the truth. Who love me enough to be willing to hurt my feelings even. Who love me enough not to just look away from the things that might be hurting me. And here's how I know there was a coach or a challenger carrying the mat that day. Because only the coach would have thought, let's go through the roof, right? Only the coach would have had the guts to say, all right, folks, get out the shovel, right? We're going through the roof. Only the coach, only the challenger would have had the courage to think and do this next level outside the box type of thing in order to get his friend in front of Jesus. So I know there was a coach or a challenger there that day. The last person carrying the mat for me is what I call the counselor. He's on the left front. And the counselor is that one you can go to when you're in trouble. That person in your life who will always be there. That person, I like to call them the confidant. You know, you can tell them anything and they'll love you anyway. This is the person who, who you can trust with their opinions and you can go to when you're in trouble. Proverbs says this, Never abandon a friend, either yours or your father's. When disaster strikes, you won't have to ask your brother for assistance. It's better to go to a neighbor than to a brother who lives far away. 
counselor is that confidant you can count on. And they're always going to point you in the right direction because they're a, a mentor in your life. They're going to give you good advice. They're going to share with you the stories of their own failures and their own challenges, hoping that you won't have to learn the same painful way they had to learn. And so a counselor is going to mentor you. Proverbs 27 says, The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. And finally, a counselor is that person who can see the forest through the trees. You know what I'm talking about, right? They can, they can kind of step back and see the big picture. Because most of the time when we feel like we're in trouble, all we can see is the problem right in front of us. We can't see solutions. We can't see opportunities. All we can see is the problem right in front of us. But the counselor is able to step back and see the whole picture. Give us wise advice. To be a bit of a life coach for us. Proverbs reminds us that as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another person. That we count on each other. And, and here's how I know there was a counselor carrying the mat that day. That day there was a counselor carrying the mat and it was a part of the team because no one but the counselor would have gone and gotten the paralyzed man in the first place. Follow me on that. No one but the counselor would have been in relationship, in connection with this paralyzed man to the point where they said, you know what, we are all got our own things to do today. We're all busy. We all got things to do. But the counselor said, time out. We got to go get our friend and bring him to Jesus. That's the job of the counselor. Someone who's there where we're in trouble and who's willing to go the extra mile for us. Do you have a counselor in your life? Do you have a, a cheerleader in your life? Do you have a, a coach in your life? Do you have a chaplain in your life? Because I'm here to tell you, church, we all need those people. Because you and I are those people, paralyzed people on the mat. And these are the people we need carrying our mat. Now some of you, as I was describing some of these character qualities of, of the coach and the, and the confidant and, the, and the, the chaplain and the cheerleader, so as I was describing them, you were thinking of people in your lives, weren't you? Were you picturing some folks that you could say, yeah, that's, that's my cheerleader. Oh, that's definitely my coach. Yep, that's my chaplain. Were you thinking about those folks? I want to ask a slightly harder question. When I ask your friends about those people, does your name pop up? Are you those people for others? Because all during this series, we have been talking about the reality that you cannot be a neighbor cannot have a neighbor unless you are a neighbor. You cannot have a friend unless you are a friend. You cannot give what you do not have. And so I guess my question is, if some of these folks are missing in your life, the question then becomes, am I those people to others? Now, I'll be honest with you, and some of you who know me pretty well, this will be no surprise, but I'm a bit of a Bible nerd, you know? I love the Bible. I love digging deep. I love asking questions. I love wrestling through God's Word, and I love digging in, and not just reading what, what's right on top and easy to access, but asking some harder questions. So this week, when I was looking at this story, I was really wrestling with some, some hard questions around this story. And one of the questions I have is, how did this story really happen? Like, how did it really happen? Jesus tells us, or Mark tells us, that it happened. But I want to know how it happened. How did it get here? And I have some other questions that go along with it. And For instance, how did these four people, how did these four friends know this paralyzed guy? How did they even get in relationship with him? Because in Jesus' day, well people did not hang out with unwell people. 
Healthy people did not hang out with sick people. Rich people did not hang out with poor people. Uh, uh, well people did not hang out with diseased people. It just didn't happen. They lived in two different communities. There was the in and the out. And if there was something wrong with you, you were out. And so my question becomes, how do these amazing people know this paralyzed man in the first place? How did they build relationship in order to pick up his mat? And bring them to Jesus. You know, another question I have is, what drove these four people to such lengths that they were willing to vandalize somebody's house in order to get this guy in front of Jesus? I mean, you got to have a pretty deep passion. I mean, I want you to picture for a moment, you invited your friend to church today and Everybody else did too. And when you pulled up, there were no parking spots. I'm guessing 20% of you would have gone, well, let's go to Frisher's. <laughs> right? I'm guessing even if you parked on the grass and then got out, if there were no seats left in the house, you'd be like, oh, time for Skyline Chili. Right? I'm guessing that if you couldn't get in the front door, you might quit. You might try something else. We'll come back next week. We'll try a different service. We'll, we'll do something else. Not th what drove these four to have such passion that they were willing to dig through somebody's roof? Friends, that is a next level kind of commitment. Where do they get that? Now, the answers to those questions are that the Bible doesn't tell us. It just doesn't. Often, Jesus just kind of lets us think those things for ourselves. And so one possible answer is, these were just amazing people, right? These were just amazing, like the story of the Good Samaritan we heard a couple of weeks ago. This, these were just kind of next level, awesome, altruistic kind of folks who were willing to go the extra mile for this stranger that, that they saw lying there on this mat. Maybe. That's possible. But most of us, if you hear that, you're kind of thinking, good for them. I'm not that. Right? And you kind of excuse yourself. I wonder, and I'm going to step away from my Bible now because this is just Dave talking. I wonder if there's another possibility. Luke tells us that Jesus had been in the house all day long teaching and healing. So in other words, so if that means for us, is that Jesus got there early in the morning and there were some people there in the house who kind of expected him. It was the family and maybe their extended family they had told. And Jesus begins teaching and healing people and the story begins to, things start getting exciting. And they didn't have text and they didn't have email and they didn't have, you know, a Snapchat or any of these kinds of things. So, so what they do then is they'd go out and they'd go get their neighbors and their friends and they'd be like, you got to come hear what Jesus is teaching. you got to come experience Jesus healing these people. It's incredible. And so the house begins to fill up because people are going and getting the people they're in community with. They're bringing their neighbors. And their neighbors are coming. And their neighbors, because they live in the same neighborhood, they're very much like themselves. But if Jesus has been healing all day long, oh, I'm getting ready to preach here, y'all. Here we go. Uh, if Jesus has been preaching all day long and he's been healing, that means there are some people, not just from the well community in the house, but there are some people from the not-so-well community in the, in the house that day. And some of them early that morning got healed. Some of them got their lives transformed. Some of them got changed and got forgiven and got their sins wiped away. And so they went to their neighborhood. And you know who lived in their neighborhood? The paralyzed man. The man who they'd spent their time with. The man who was on the margins of society. The man who'd been an outcast. And so they went and got their friend because they were in deep relationship with him. And they said, Jesus healed me. Maybe Jesus can heal you too. And so they pick up his mat and they say they bring him to Jesus and they're so sure that Jesus can heal. You know why they're so sure? Because Jesus had already healed them. And so they're so connected and they're so sure that Jesus can heal that they are willing to vandalize some perfect stranger's house in order to get their best friend in front of Jesus and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. 
I don't know if that's what God had in mind. I don't know if that's what's happening here. But I know that has something to tell us. Because here's what I know, friends. Most of the time, when we don't share our faith with our neighbors, when we don't evangelize, when we don't invite, when we don't share the love of Jesus with our neighbors, most of the time, it's because we've forgotten. At one point, it was me laying on that mat. At one point, I was lost. Now I'm found. At one point, I was blind. And now I see. Now, it may have been a while since I've had my life transformed. It may have been a few minutes since I've been healed by Jesus. It may have been a while since I have experienced the life-transforming grace of God in my life. And so it's easy for me to forget. And I just go about doing my thing. But these four friends, they didn't forget. They knew and their lives had been transformed. Here's what I've begun to learn about evangelism, what I've begun to learn about ministry and mission, that healed people heal people. Invited people invite people. Found people find people. Forgiven people forgive people. Saved people save people. Loved people love people. And transformed people transform people. Somebody give me an amen on that. Folks, this is, this is our call. Those of us who call ourselves by the name of Christ, we once were lying on the mat and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Get up, take your mat, and don't stay here in church. He said, get out of here, go back to your neighborhood and bring me your neighbors broken as they are, sinful as they are, helpless as they are, bring them and watch what I do. This is why I love the communion celebration, friends. Because communion reminds us that apart from the broken body of Jesus, we're still lying on the mat. Apart from the sacrifice that Jesus made, we are still suffering in sin. Apart from the, the gift God gave us, we are all still lost. After dinner, Jesus took the cup and he, he said, guys, this is about forgiveness. This is a fresh start. This is about all those days you thought it was about you and it's really about me. This is a reminder that you used to be the one on the mat. And Jesus' call for us in communion is to remember our own healing, to remember our own transformation, to remember our own salvation, and then to ask, which one of my neighbors needs what I've been given? Who are you bringing to Jesus? Who? Are you bringing to Jesus? Whose mat are you carrying? Because friends, that's the way we change the world. One neighbor at a time. Communion is the gift that Jesus gave His disciples and it was His way of reminding them that when you tend to forget, when you think you've had it all together, just remember, without me, you're lost. You're stuck in sin. You're broken. But this is my reminder to you that I healed you so that you can heal others. I saved you so that you can save others. I transformed you so that you can transform others. In my name, in the name of Jesus.